So right off the bat, this book sets itself apart from the rest of the series with dead parents. Jacqueline DeForest's mother died when she was five, and her father was out of the picture when she was a toddler. So Jacqueline was raised by her aunt Greta. I think the only other book with dead parents is The Ghost Next Door, but only because everyone was dead in that one. It's not that this is too taboo for children's media, I mean Disney and all that, but Arnold Stein very, very rarely gets away from the happy husband and wife family dynamics. So right away I'm intrigued. Jacqueline grew up in Chicago, but she gets a shock when Aunt Greta packs up their things and, for no discernible reason, moves the two of them to Sherpia, a small snowy village on the edge of the Arctic Circle, sitting at the foot of a small mountain. We're never actually told what country this is. It could be Northern Canada, it could be Greenland, it could be Russia. There's no identifiable culture here to deduce anything from besides the fact that everyone speaks perfect English and all the houses have flat roofs in a part of the world where it snows year round. Our book opens with Jacqueline and Greta arriving at their new home. Jacqueline is very miffed. This town has nothing. No mall, no movie theater, no Michael Jordan, just snow and snowmen. A lot of snowmen, actually. A lot of identical snowmen, with the same red scarves, stick arms in the same positions, and most odd, a carved scar in one cheek. Most of the early chapter ending cliffhangers is Jacqueline walking around town, and then a mysterious shadow creeps up on her or she runs into a scary monster. Only, surprise, it's actually one of the snowmen. However, despite how isolating it is, there's something about this place that has jostled Jacqueline's memories, and she starts recalling the first half of a poem her mother used to tell her when she was little. When the snow blow wild and the day grows old, beware the snowman, my child. Beware the snowman. He brings the cold. The town seems mostly empty. The only living souls Jacqueline encounters are two children, Eli and Rolanda, who go around town and build these identical snowmen. Eli is a bit annoying, but Rolanda hits it off with our protagonist pretty easily, but warns her away of going up the mountain. Rolanda won't say why, and being an American, Jacqueline is all, lol, whatever, you can't tell me what to do, and so she starts to walk up the mountain path by herself. Partway up, Jacqueline finds a cabin that seems abandoned, so she Goldilocks her way inside, only to find an older man named Conrad and his giant pet wolf, Wolfbane. The man seems threatening and warns the young girl to not go any further, for on top of the mountain is an ice cave, and in that ice cave is an evil snowman. Beware the snowman, child. The man and the wolf chase her back down the mountain path, and Jacqueline runs all the way back home. Not a lot actually happens in the first two-thirds of the book. There's no active threats, just vague warnings that there's something evil out there, and Jacqueline hears some howling in the middle of the night. And you know what? I'm really vibing with this part. The village of Sherpia is quiet, empty, dark. The houses are identical, with identical snowmen outside. It's this uncanny space. And the horror element in this first part of the book is simply the tension of existing in an uncanny space. The wind had stopped. The whole world seemed still and silent. No cars, I realized. No horns honking, no buses roaring past, no people laughing and shouting on the street. I'm all alone out here, I told myself. The world is mine. It's tapping into the same uneasy feeling of walking through a communal space after hours, going through a school or a mall or a city center when there's not a soul in sight, when you're the only person who exists in this moment. It feels wrong in an almost animal brain kind of way, and it's solid horror atmosphere. It won't last, there's a bug-eyed monster that jumps out and goes boo later on, but for now, damn Stein, I'm vibin'. Eventually Jacqueline convinces Rolanda to tell her what the deal with the mountain even is, so Rolanda tells the tale. 
in an empty church no less, a rather somber location for Goosebumps book. So, once upon a time. Two sorcerers who lived in the village were fiddling around with some magic and then accidentally created an evil living snowman. They couldn't control it and they couldn't destroy it, so with the help of the rest of the village, they instead chased it up the mountain and forced it into that ice cave. The snowmen that Rolanda and Eli make are a sort of ritual to keep the monster satiated. It'll see these tributes to it and go, okay. I won't destroy the village this time. You guys are such flatterers. Jacqueline doesn't buy this story, but then Eli comes in and claims to have seen the monster snowman himself. This is intriguing enough for Jacqueline all by itself, but then you throw in that poem she suddenly remembered, and Aunt Greta is acting oddly protective and yet still won't explain why they moved here. And well, Jacqueline is now determined to get to the bottom of this. So she convinces Rolanda and Eli to distract Conrad and Wolfbane, the apparent guardians of the mountain, while she makes her way up the path. This mountain, by the way, it's gotta be tiny considering how quickly and easily people are making their way up it. But yes, at the top there's an ice cave, and inside that ice cave there's a moving, living snowman. It demands to know who Jacqueline is. My name? I squeaked. My name is Jacqueline. Jacqueline de Forest. The snowman's tree branch arm shot up. Its dark mouth gaped open in surprise. Say it again, it ordered. I shivered in the waves of cold. Jacqueline de Forest, I repeated in my tiny, frightened voice. The snowman stared down at me in silence for a long while. It lowered its arms to its round white sides. Do you know who I am? It demanded. I swallowed hard. The question took me totally by surprise. I opened my mouth to answer, but no sound came out. Do you know who I am? The snowman thundered. No, I squeaked. Who are you? I am your father. The snowman cried. No! A long wail escaped my throat. That's impossible! Yeah, while I was digging the first part of this book, the monster-heavy climax is just kind of a mess. The snowman claims to be Jacqueline's father, turned into this form by Jacqueline's mother, both mom and Aunt Greta being sorceresses. Greta returned to the village all abruptly as she did, because the magic that traps him in this form, and in this cave, only lasts ten years, and Greta needs to be here to renew it. Daddy Snowman needs Jacqueline's help to lift the curse, but can't explain it directly, just hinting that it has something to do with that poem Jacqueline half remembers. Jacqueline thinks about returning home and searching through Greta's things for answers, but then Greta just shows up at the top of the mountain. She claims she's not a sorceress and doesn't know any magic. But rather, Jacqueline's parents were the sorcerers in Rolanda's story from earlier, having accidentally created this monster and banishing it to the mountain. Then Dad disappeared and Mom, Greta, and baby Jacqueline ran to Chicago to get away. Greta isn't magical herself, but she does know the process to renew the magic and stop the monster. Jacqueline doesn't know what to make of any of this. She doesn't know who to believe. But Greta brought up a book of poetry for the ritual, the book where the snowman poem comes from. Jacqueline's gotta know, so she grabs the book, finds the poem, and reads the rest of it out loud. When the snows melt and the warm sun is with thee, beware the snowman, for the snowman shall go free. And with that, the snowman melts, revealing its true form, a boring generic demon. All seems lost, but then, like the tin soldiers in Babes in Toyland, the snowmen from the village march up the mountain path and smother the monster with their bodies, encasing it once again in enchanted snow. Conrad shows up and reveals that he is actually Jacqueline's dad. He stayed behind to make sure the evil snowman didn't try anything, enchanting the village snowman as a last line of defense. And so, the monster is... defeated? 
trapped? I'm not really sure on that. The family is reunited. A few of the village snowmen act a bit cheeky. The end. Okay. Yeah, this wasn't an all-time great, but it wasn't a disaster either. A, a solid C+, plus, if you will. As I said before, it's certainly stronger in the first half than the second, with both its unique dead mother setup and some solid atmosphere with the snowy, near-abandoned village of which no country will claim. Just having exposition take place in a church feels like more thought and effort than Stein usually gives it. The book actually taps into that Northern Europe folklore slash fairy tale vibe way better than Legend of the Lost Legend did. It's a bummer that it doesn't stick the landing, taking away all of that clever setup in the first half and reducing it to a silly monster romp. It demystifies what came before it. The way the kids talk about the village's history with the sorcerers and the snowman making ritual make it seem like it's something that's been going on for generations, centuries of snowman building to fend off this medieval monster. This book was published in 1997, so if we take that as the year this story takes place, then the monster was created in 1987. So the same span of time married with children was on the air. Having the monster actually be a generic demon inside a snowman suit really disappoints how visually interesting the snowman form was. It's the scar that gets me. Why would a snowman have a scar like that? It's the kind of small but unusual detail that tickles the brain. So with that in mind, the Goosebumps monthly traditional rewrite. There's not much in the first half of the book I change, except give those poor houses proper slanted roofs. As for the second half, there's one major change I'd make that would probably be challenged by the publishers. It's potentially pretty intense, but I do think it's picking up what the first half of the book was setting down. In my version of the book, the snowman actually is Jacqueline's father. Yes, the I am your father moment is presented as a cheesy pop culture reference, but the implications of if that were true are pretty sad and pretty staggering. It suggests a man who was bad enough that his wife was forced to curse him and escape to another country. That suggests an abusive husband and father. What you would have here is a story about a child having to deal with the sins of the past, of having to come to terms with events that happened before they could remember. It's something we all deal with as we grow up, discovering the problems of the past that we had nothing to do with, but nonetheless inherit. We didn't start the fire. I do wonder if this was the original intent of the story. It's that goddamn scar. It's such a specific detail that you kind of expect a scene of Jacqueline going through Aunt Greta's things, looking for clues and finding an old picture of her father. The man in the photo having a scar on their cheek in the exact same place as the snowman. It just all fits together way too well. Of course, a story about a girl discovering and having to confront her long-lost abusive father is very intense and requires a deft hand to do it right. Do I think Arl Stein would be capable of that? No, 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 absolutely not. If this was the original pitch, I'm glad it was changed. I don't even have the confidence that I could do it, and this is my rewrite. It's heavy. But I do think it's a much better conclusion to this book than the generic demon trapped in a snowman. Still, this book wasn't that bad. Not great. Not even good, but pretty okay. Some good atmosphere and a few unique creative decisions to make it stand out. I didn't mind reading it, which for this series is quite the accomplishment. I give Beware the Snowman some onion powder out of 10.